Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Shatayra Bokurianda Yela Maha Halamundoro Bokoshe Aramaha Hiadadadada Bokurianda Ramaha Sete in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hinjiji Rakoto La Baha Yaranda La Baha in the name of the Lord, the Andala Maha Yaramaha. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, he had an anama hand at the book. Oya la la bahaya, he had a in the name, in the name, he had a mo yaranaye, he had an anama under the bush. He had an anama haya, he had a man under the bush. He had an Alabardi alabardi under the boko shanda yalamahaye. He ananananamo under the bose alamahaya. He namandor the boko shataya. He ananaboko the under the andaye. He alamandor the boshataye. In the name of Jesus, Shanda Rabahaye. Arabahaye. He alabardi alabordi under the boko tolobohoya. Let your will be done, let your will be done. Father, in the name of Jesus. We command every spirit, O oh Lord, and every opposition that gets in the way tonight to be removed. We command every barrier, every wall, every hindrance to be broken down and cleared out of the way. Lord, let your will be done. Hallelujah, the spirit of John upon us that makes way, O oh Lord, that prepares the way of the Lord, that clears out every opposition, Lord, and every hindrance. Come on, let's prepare the way of the Lord right now. Let's bind and loose things right now. Let's prepare the way of the Lord. So that God can do whatever He wants to do through us. Command every opposition in this place, every spirit that is not of your will to be removed. Come on. Stir up the gift that is inside of you. Come on, whatever is keeping you from moving in the spirit, clear it out of the way. Clear it out of the way. I bind every spirit of condemnation off of us. I bind every spirit of shame off of us that is trying to get in the way of your will. 
for our lives in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus. Come on, the more we keep doing this, the more the opposition gets cleared out, the more there's liberty, the more freedom we feel. So can we just keep on going in the spirit right now? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody stir up that gift. Somebody let the Spirit of God flow through them right now. That's it. Keep on praying right now. Just keep on flowing. Hardama, keep on flowing. Come on, that's it, that's it. Come on, let it flow. Come on, let it flow. Come on, we bind every obstacle and every hindrance in this place. We bind every hindrance in our city. We bind every hindrance to the flow of the Holy Ghost. We clear it out of the way. It's not the spirit of the Lord like a hammer that breaketh the rocks in pieces. Come on. It's not the spirit of the Lord like a rushing mighty wind. Come on, let's bind together right now. Let's bind together right now. We bind together in the spirit of unity. We bind together in the level of unity that you have presented. Come on, that's it. That's it. Shut he Come on, God is trying to take us higher right now. He's trying to get us to go deeper. He's trying to get us to a deep place. Come on, that's it. Let the living water flow. Let the living water flow. Let the living water flow. Come on, this is not meant to be contained. This has to be let out. This has to flow. Come on, that's it. You can't contain the spirit of God. It has to flow. You can't contain a river. A river flows. Come on, 
Yes. Come on, that's it. Let the living water flow through you. Let the living water flow through you. Let the living water flow from Mission Viejo, Lord. Let your living water flow all over Mission Viejo and South Orange County. Let there be a baptism of the river of the living water. Come on, it's like fire. Shut up in your bones. You cannot contain it. You cannot stop yourself from speaking in tongues. You cannot quench the spirit. You have to let it out. Come on, quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. Come on, whatever you're feeling to pray for, quench not the spirit. Let it out. Yes. Come on, let it flow. Let it flow. Come on, the Holy Ghost is doing this. The Holy Ghost is moving. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, come on, come on, don't stop. Come on, it's not the will of the Lord for you to be timid. It's not the will of the Lord for you to be afraid in this place. It's the will of God for you to be fearless. It is the will of God for you to be bold. Come on, it is not the will of the Lord for you to be fearful when you go out in the streets. It is not of the will of God for you to be timid when you knock on doors. God wants to baptize us with His Spirit, but He wants to baptize us with His boldness. That whatever you do, boldness begins to follow. Whatever you begin to speak, Boldness begins to follow. That whenever you lay hands, you don't wonder if they're going to get their miracle. But there's boldness. Come on. Let there be boldness in this place. Let there be a holy boldness. Come on. I loose a spirit of fearlessness upon us. I loose a spirit of boldness upon us. I bind every spirit of timidity and fear out of us. It's the will of God for us to be bold. Come on. Boldness comes from confidence. Boldness comes from confidence in God. Come on. That's it. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Sanda kata 
Come on, come on. We're not stopping prayer. We're going to flow with the river right now. We're going to go until God says to. Come on, the Alabardia Namaha Yaramaha. Come on, if you're waiting for something to be spoken, this is it. This is the flow right now. You don't have to wait for something to happen. It is already happening right now. There is already a flow of the Holy Ghost. Come on, we're going to flow right now. Come on, we're going to go with the flow right now. Come on, let it flow to every city, let it flow to every neighborhood right now. Come on, I feel a little bit of opposition right now. Can we just push that back right now? I feel a little bit of pushback in the name of Jesus. Can we just bite together right now? Come on, this is not a program. This is a flow of the Spirit. Come on, we're going to go until we feel a spirit of freedom. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Come on, let's push in the spirit till we feel the liberty. Till we feel no more chains. Till we feel there's no more any pushing us back. Come on, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is no fear. There is only liberty. Come on. Come on, if you deal with fear or timidity, God is going to deliver you tonight. God is going to get rid of it tonight. We're going to pray until we feel liberty right now. We're going to pray until fear begins to leave. We're going to pray until it's broken. Come on, would you begin to prevail in prayer right now? Would you just begin to push in the Spirit? I bind every spirit of fear off of us. I command every spirit of disunity and timidity. Oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I lose your love. I lose your revelation and an understanding of your love upon your body. Come on, we need to push in the spirit. We need to push in the spirit. Come on. What would happen if you entered into your school and you felt no fear to pray for people? What would happen if you went to your neighborhood and you felt the boldness of the Holy Ghost? Come on. That's what God wants to do. Where there's no more fear. There's no more fear. But you feel the liberty of the Spirit. Come on, 
Come on. We can get there. There's a place we can get to where there's no fear and there's no timidity. Come on, this is what we're going to do. If it's possible, I wonder if everybody could just come to the front right now. Just keep on praying, but if you could make your way to the front. God is going to impart a spirit of boldness in this place. And some of you have felt fear these past few days. But God is going to completely remove that. He's going to remove that spirit. He's going to remove that timidity. Because God's not giving you that spirit. He's giving you power and he's giving you love. So that's what's going to happen right now. I wonder if we could all just begin to lift up our hands. And if we could just begin to receive the love of God. And you're going to feel a boldness come upon you. And when that boldness comes upon you, begin to pray with that boldness like never before. Begin to pray with that new level of boldness. It's going to feel like nothing can stop you. It's going to feel like you can do all things through Christ. It's going to feel like you can run through a troop and leap over a wall. You're going to feel the boldness come upon you. Come on, that's it. Come on, the enemy's been lying to you. You are a son of God. That's it. Pray with that authority. Come on, everybody, make your way to the front right now. Come to this altar right now. I bind every spirit of timidity. I bind every spirit of fear. He let it be removed. Let it be removed. Come on, just keep on praying right now. Keep on praying right now. Come on. The spirit of timidity is leaving. The spirit of timidity is leaving. Come on. You can't teach Bible studies. You can't see the lost save. It's not impossible. Come on. Did you hear that? It's not impossible. God can do it. He's just looking for an available conduit. Everyone in this place, would you just begin to lift up your voice? Would you just begin to lift up your voice? Yeah. Now would you just begin to thank God for removing the fear and removing the timidity. Would you just begin to worship? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I feel strongholds beginning to be pulled down. I feel strongholds breaking right now. Strongholds that have been that haven't been pulled down before. They're being pulled down right now. Come on, opposition that you've been fighting for in your city for years is finally being removed. Come on, let's begin to bind together. Come on, 
It is removed. It is removed. It is removed. Would you shout unto God with the voice of triumph? There is nothing to fear. Come on, that's it. Come on. Would you begin to pray for somebody right now if it's appropriate? Uh, would you just begin to lay hands on somebody? Come on, everybody, find somebody to pray with that God is leading you. Lord, I loose the spirit of faith upon us. I loose the gift of faith upon us. Come on, that's it. Come on, that's it. Brother Allen, God is touching your body right now. Come on, that's it. Let it flow. Let it flow. Come on, pray for the person beside you. Kayara, kayara, kaye. Kayara, kayara, kaye. I lose miracle signs and wonders to begin to follow your people. I lose the miracles. Come on, God is saying this to every single person in this place that He is giving you power, He has given you authority, He is giving you dominion to walk in right now. Would you receive that power, that dunamis power, that Holy Ghost power? In the name of Jesus. Come on, God is still moving upon some of you right now. Would you just begin to lift your hands all over this place? Come on, if you believe that God has something special in store for you tonight, would you just begin to lift up your hands right now all over this sanctuary? And would you just begin to worship God with the fruit of your lips? Hallelujah, hallelujah.
something that you need to cast a care casting something you don't care about that's easy to do what it matters when your mind your will your emotions your being is invested and it weighs you down that's an opportunity to experience casting your cares according to the Bible and this is a help right here it's a guide that you and I have already known, many of you have practiced. Would you do this right now if you need to forgive somebody, if you need to forgive yourself, if you need to forgive your mistakes in the name of Jesus? Would you do that right now even if you need to forgive God? Things that you cannot understand that's happened, things that you're carrying, mistakes you made, things said over you, opposition you've encountered. Hallelujah. 
Lord, we forgive, oh God. We forgive, oh Lord. For we know we need forgiveness as well. So we forgive others in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Come on, would you put your spirit into it? Would you let the Holy Ghost lead you into it? And guide you into it. Father, I forgive in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I, oh, I labor. I, I, I work. Oh, that my conscience is void of any offense. And if I forgive, I forgive in the person of Jesus Christ. Because he has forgiven me, I forgive as well in Jesus' name. When God convicts you, he never condemns you. When God speaks to us in conviction, he never condemns us. He never tells us, well, you blew, you've blown it, you made a mistake, and there's no hope. That's not the voice of God. That's the voice of condemnation. That's the voice of the adversary. Don't listen to that. The conviction of God huh, convicts us of what we've done wrong. Huh? But he says, come, let us reason together. We can make this all right. Huh? Let's talk this over. Huh? Let's pray. Let's speak. Let's dialogue. Huh? And the blood of the Lord washes everything huh? and covers everything. If you need to repent right now, would you do that in the name of Jesus Christ? Lord, I repent of words. I repent of thoughts. God, I repent of actions in the name of Jesus Christ. Now would you cast your cares? Here it is, Father. Here it is, Father. I give it to you. God, I give it to you. I cast it to you, oh Lord. I'm not going to carry it anymore. And it is a process. It might take you some time. But keep doing it because it will leave your spirit. It will leave your soul and you'll feel a release. You'll feel the peace of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Would you surrender your will right now? I know we're doing this in a hurry. Amen. But it is something that you need to experience and practice. Especially in your own prayer time. I surrender my will, God. I can't force anything, oh Lord. I cannot be anxious about anything. But in all things with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I make my request known unto you, oh God. And the God of peace shall cover us. Shall wash us. In the name of Jesus, somebody rejoice right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I speak victory. Oh, I claim my victory. Victory in the name of Jesus. Victory in the name. That's where our victory comes from. That's where your victory comes from. Every day that victory is available. Hallelujah. Every single moment that victory is available. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day, every moment, every second that victory is available. Possess it. Take it. Don't get locked into your situation that you're currently in right now. Don't get locked into that right now. That is temporary. The things that you go through, they are temporary. The things of this world, they are temporary. But the things of God, is the eternal spirit of the Lord that's in you. The kingdom of God that is without wind and is in you. Those are permanent things. That's what I'm going to invest myself in, God. That's what I'm going to give my, my energy in, oh Lord. That's what I'm going to think about, concentrate about all these other things, oh God. If you want me to have it, you're just going to add it to me, oh Lord. I'm not going to even going to seek after it, God. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to seek you, Father. And I'm going to experience victory, oh Lord. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The Lord gives us a pattern where we, when we go through things. And he went 
to the crucifixion. And the Bible says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He did not get locked into his current situation, but he looked ahead. Who for the joy set before him, what joy? There will be people on February 16, 2022, gathered in the building that has been blood-bought, that they're on their way to heaven. And that's the joy of the Lord, that he has filled us with his spirit, that we are the bride of Christ, that everything in this world is temporary. He is number one. He is our first love. He's the only one that matters. He's the only one that can satisfy. He's the only one. That's why there's one God. Oh, that's why he said, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's the first and the greatest commandment. Everything else hang upon it. So you could have victory right now. You could have victory. The trick of our mind, the trick of our human mind, the carnal mind, it's an enmity, enmity against God. The tendency to get locked in right now. What's, not, what's happening or not happening. Usually in what's not happening, right? If it's happening, then you feel victorious. But even that doesn't last forever, does it? And so even that, you got to give that to the Lord. You can't even get locked into that. But more so when it's not happening, you got to look ahead. In fact, you could rejoice now in the middle of casting your cares. You could rejoice now. You know, the ending of the book of Acts is so interesting because it is this principle that Paul, who was under house arrest, said in the Holy Ghost, no man forbidding him. He was locked. He can't get out. The Roman government has imprisoned him but he looked ahead he was not locked in his in his present condition he looked ahead everybody that had victory always looked ahead joseph looked ahead in prison moses looked ahead abraham looked ahead in fact the bible says that he was ready to kill isaac but in his mind, God is able to raise him up. That's what the book of Hebrews said. He looked ahead. So I speak victory. That principle is displayed over and over again. That woman, that Elisha, Elisha, I think, Elijah prophesied that, that bore a son that died and, and went to the prophet and Gehazi went to ask her, is, is it okay with you? Is it okay with your husband? Is it okay with the child? All those questions, she said, it is well. It is well. Three times, it is well. Was it well? No, he wasn't. But he was looking ahead. He was looking ahead. She was looking ahead rather to the victory that she knows she could possess right now. She does not have to wait until it's right there. That does not require faith. You, learn, you and I look ahead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. That's a revelation from the Lord. Never thought about that. Never said it quite like that. I have a note. <laughs> That's the Lord. Would you receive that right now? Would you just, just receive it with your spirit? That impartation. That impartation that God has just given to you because He loves you and He cares for you. And it pleases the Father to give you and I the kingdom. It has pleased the Father to have chosen you to be His bride and His body on the earth. Even a son, a child of God that He flows through. And He has great plans. Amen. He has great plans. His kingdom is everlasting. We can't get locked down to what's not happening or happening on this earth. we got to have victory right now. In the midst of trouble, there is victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Caleb marched around the desert for 40 years amen but he did not waver because he knew I'm looking ahead give me that mountain I'm as strong now as I was then give me my mountain
maybe we'll preach about that this Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for that thought in Jesus' name. Praise God. This coming, this next, tomorrow actually, 17th, we should be a connect group. Amen. Keep it in prayer. Uh, Connie that's been coming and Amber that they witnessed this past Tuesday. In Jesus' name. Keep reaching for somebody. If each one of us will reach one, it will glorify God. Amen. Herein is our Father glorified that we bear much fruit. And that our fruit would remain. We have, we'll be giving out these home Bible study commitment cards. And as of today, I believe we have taught 19 people Bible studies. Would you thank the Lord for that? And we're going to be praying for them. I thank those of you that have, have taught. And we, we, it's on the website, How to Teach Into His Marvelous Light. It's on the website, rightly dividing, uh, excuse me, a place prepared for you is there as well. There's invitation cards outside that you could invite people and connect with them so you could teach them the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Sister Chica, would you come? She's going to teach tonight. And we appreciate her. hoping to have some handouts for you but I'm sorry I ran out of time but in this teaching I'm gonna try to equip you to remember it already although I will work on the handouts and Lord willing I'll have it ready this weekend and I'll email to all of you and you're welcome all right so the title of this lesson tonight is how to teach salvation to the indoctrinated so the goal of this lesson tonight and the previous Wednesdays we've had amen is to better equip us to become fluent in teaching salvation and this one list this lesson particularly to the indoctrinated and the ones that I'm referring to in this lesson are those who believe in the baptism that the, the baptism in the titles father son holy ghost and also those who deny the need to speak in tongues and i know that these type of people are the more challenging ones that we prefer not to deal with amen don't worry i'm one of those <laughs> but god has given us the revelation and we all, all of us, all of us, have the responsibility to proclaim the truth to them. And that requires preparation. Preparation. <laughs> to become fluent in teaching, you need to understand the principles, right? Especially the ones that we're going to be reviewing tonight and new things that we're going to be learning amen and it is not enough just to know it okay not just enough to know it you need to study to understand it so that you can teach it just like you're telling a familiar story for me that's how i would define fluency that's how it sounds like you're telling a story the same story all over again like you really know all the details okay and then you will need to also memorize certain references in the Bible. That's important, okay? And I, and, and I would try to, if you can do the, the book and the verse, that's okay. But I'll show you where in even just the chapter, okay? Even just the chapter, not um, the exact, um, you know, verse, the other part of it, okay? Um, so we need to memorize certain references in the Bible because this is what gives foundation to your teaching okay or else you just told them a story <laughs> you need to have the bullets amen you need to have the scriptures that they could say oh wow what they told me was in the word of God wow so that they cannot deny 
what you taught them was in the word of God. All right? So we need to get this, amen? And um, this lesson covers two areas that are challenging, and, and I wanted to combine it for tonight, and we'll see how long this lesson will go, amen? <laughs> but the Lord's going to help us in this, and I pray that um, we will become, as, as we prayed earlier, more confident, amen? More confident and ready to teach the word to every soul, even the most challenging ones, in Jesus' name. So when we teach this Bible study, we want to set the foundation of biblical guidelines, okay? Whenever we teach a specific doctrine, it's very important for us to have the foundation of biblical guidelines. These principles will serve both, take note, to support your teaching, okay, and to refute their false doctrines. So it's going to serve two purposes. I promise you they'll hesitate to answer you or to say something <laughs> when you establish these principles, okay? Biblical guidelines. They'll like, kind of like think twice before they say something, okay? Because you're setting the foundation of these principles that you are following yourself. And you're letting them know you need to follow this too because it's in the word of God. All right. So... I chose three, three biblical principles. If you remember lesson seven in the laborers and training book, there's one that teaches you how to study the word and has a lot of principles. But to just save time in teaching, I focused on these three and I pretty much think they're pretty good. But if needed, you know, you can add on these other principles if needed. So you have to go with the flow. You, you study so that you're ready and that whenever needed, you just present the other principles. Okay, but there are three, three that I think are going to be very helpful um, to this group that you're going to be teaching, the indoctrinated ones. So um, number one, I would say that we always need to have more than one verse in the Bible to support our teaching. I'll say that, hey, I'm, I'm teaching you a Bible study, and so um, it's important that I give you more than one verse, okay? Um, and we have scriptures for that. Matthew 18, 16 says, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And 2 Corinthians 13, 1 says this. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So if I'm going to give you an interpretation of something, of a thought, if I give you a belief, I need to have at least two verses to support that. All right? Okay. Number two principle that I would like to provide to the students is that there should not be any verse in the Bible that would contradict my teaching or our teaching or doctrine or our interpretation of scripture. And you would think that's common sense, right? <laughs> but they do not follow that, okay? Um, so I will say it, okay, that this, I, I want to, you know, I want to follow this rule and a scripture here that we could use is 2 Timothy 3.16. And you, you might find other scriptures. For the sake of time, I'm limiting the number of scriptures here. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Since all scripture is relevant and profitable for teaching doctrine, we cannot omit any verse in the Bible, right? Okay. So not only is it unbiblical to base a doctrine on solely one scripture, but 
if there is any scripture in the Bible that contradicts its interpretation, then that would also make that doctrine as unbiblical or false. Makes sense, right? Okay. And then I would give this third one um, that we must rightly divide the word of God in order to acquire the correct interpretation of scripture. And you know this first, second Timothy two fifteen, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So basically what this means simply is that we need to make sure that you are getting your supporting verse from the right book or the right division of the Bible. That's basically what it means. Okay? And, and we have guidelines to show, show them that we've done that. Okay? All right. So who can tell me the four divisions of the New Testament in its correct order? Who's a volunteer that can give me all four in the right order? Yes, Brother Dylan? Gospels? Book of Acts? The epistles, Revelation, correct, very good. All right, so how do we divide the word? All right, he put that there, okay, he said it. How do we divide the word? Okay, so we need to determine the time when the New Testament plan of salvation was in effect in each division. Sister, it's New Testament. I thought it already starts in the first book. Does it? Or the first division. Does it start? Okay, the Gospels. Why not? All right, the testator was still alive. Jesus was still alive. The testament takes effect after the death of the testator. Amen? All right, and there are examples and you will read in the Gospels wherein the Lord Jesus Christ forgave, right? Forgave their sin. They didn't even repent, <laughs> right? Um, and then remember the thief on the cross, right? He joined him in heaven, amen? All right, so you'll read examples as well in the Gospels, but that, that's a good answer. Thank you. All right, because the Gospels, I would say the Gospels, if you're going to explain it to them, is a transition, Transition between the Old and the New Testament, okay? So the Old Testament law did not apply, and the infilling of the Spirit wasn't ready yet, right? Because the Lord was still alive, okay? His Spirit wasn't given yet. All right. So, so we need to know the time, right, when the New Testament plan of salvation was in effect in each division, okay? And we gave you the answer when that time frame is, all right? Or, or we told you what is not. <laughs> okay, then we also need to know who the book or division directly applies to. Okay, so we need the time frame when we're finding the right book where we're getting our references to support our belief. And we're trying to find, to figure out who is this book for? Who is it applying to? Okay, because every book is different, right? Okay. So that's how rightly dividing the word of God is, okay? So, so who the book directly applies to? Is the purpose of the book to teach the unsaved about salvation? Or is it to instruct the saved or the born-again church member on how he can continue to grow in his walk with God. So you see those are two different groups, right? So the context, the teaching would be different in these books depending on who it's addressed to. All right. So these are the three biblical principles that I would use in my Bible study to support our doctrine of salvation when I teach this group of people who believe in the word. They believe in the word, okay? But not have, but they have not rightly divided the word of God. All right. So I'm going to be teaching 
the doctrine of salvation, and I'll use you as my students as well, okay? So I believe that the doctrine of salvation is repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. I believe in that. And my main verse that I'm going to show you is in Acts 2.38. So, I would usually like to give them more background on the scripture before I read the verse to them. Why do I do that? Because a lot of Christians don't even know about the book of Acts. Okay, so if you're quoting a scripture from the, scripture from the book of Acts, Give them the background, okay? Um, and by providing them with more background, it will help to give them more context and understanding. And with understanding, they can receive revelation. Revelation. Revelation's what renews their mind, amen? Okay. So I would say, well, I'm talking to you, the students. Okay, so Peter was preaching to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. And whenever they, they're not familiar, you could just say what it is. Okay, all right, whatever's needed um, to explain, you can do that. Um, you all know the day of Pentecost, right? Okay, so Peter was preaching to the Jews on the day of Pentecost um, who witnessed and questioned. So while he was preaching to the Jews, on the day of Pentecost, right? They witnessed and questioned 120 believers of Jesus Christ who were filled with the Holy Ghost for the first time, okay? And after Peter told them, he preached to them because they questioned, what is this? Are they drunk, okay? They, and, and Peter preached to them and told them that they had crucified the Messiah. I'm doing a quick version on that, okay? I usually like to say more, okay, but I'm going to um, do a quicker version. And they were convicted and asked him what they should do. And this was Peter's response to them, Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So I would pause there a little bit and see. I like to connect with them. I like what Brother John taught us the last time. Feel out your audience. You know, eye contact. That way I know, oh, do I need to say that again? Um, do I need to change the wordings? Do I need to explain a part? Do they not get it? You read them. Okay, read them. Or you might lose something in between. Okay, you want it to flow for the revelation to flow. Okay, so I would pause and I'll, maybe you could say, did that make sense? Any question? And maybe they say, um, okay, maybe they're nodding their head. Okay, that's good. Okay, and, I, and they could, we could talk about other things later on. Now I want to tell you that I want to show you other verses that support the same interpretation of Acts 2.38. Because, as I said earlier, I can't base this doctrine on only one verse. Okay, so I'm going to give you more verses to prove that this is the doctrine of salvation. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, before that, okay. Remember that we already started with the Jews, right? In chapter 2, okay. So when, the other verses will will not be chapter 2, will be the other verses. And we're using the book of Acts, okay, the examples. Okay, and I would go in chronological order so that it would be easier to remember when we teach. Okay, so we did two already. That was the opening verse, okay, two. Okay, so after that, we have eight, right? Acts eight. Okay, the Samaritans, okay? So once again, I would give a um, little background to the verse before I would read it. All right, Philip evangelized to the people of Samaria. 
okay? He had the gift of evangelism, okay, P, um, Philip. And they were baptized, but they had not yet received the Holy Ghost. Then the Lord directed him to go to Ethiopia. Remember how he ministered to the eunuch, okay? So as he was leaving, um, since they were not yet re re they haven't received the gift of the Holy Ghost, um, somebody had to take over. So the apostles in Jerusalem heard about the Samaritans receiving the gospel, and they sent Peter and John to minister to them so that they can be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is important because we can't just throw verses there and they're like, huh? Because I promise you they haven't even read the book of Acts, okay? So give the background, okay? So, in Acts 8.16, it talks about um, what happened, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. The scripture's already there. For as yet he was fallen upon none, as yet he was fallen upon none of them, the Holy Ghost meaning, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, that proves that the Samaritans were baptized in the name of the of Jesus, right? Okay, very good. And then remember, I'm going in chronological order of what I, Acts 2, right, was the beginning verse. Acts 8 was the next Samaritans. I'm helping you to memorize. <laughs> Acts 8, okay. And then who would guess the next group or person? Yes, Cornelius. Okay, Cornelius, okay. Who is the first Gentile that was saved, right? Okay. And the story of Cornelius is a great story to tell with all the details. But we're going to skip these details. Um, and, and we know that Cornelius was a God-fearing and religious man, right? But he still needed to do something to be saved. Because he received a vision of an angel that directed him on what he needs to do to, to call for Peter that needs to tell him what he needs to do, right? And we know how, um, well, they don't know it, so you're telling the story. <laughs> and so um, Peter received a vision from the Lord, right, that he did not understand about to eat certain foods that were forbidden. And so he was not, it was not registering in his mind what the Lord was trying to tell him until he heard some knocking on the door, his door or his gate, Okay, these were three men from Cornelius sent to tell him to go to Cornelius' house. Okay, so then, and then it clicked in his mind, oh, that's what the Lord's trying to tell me to do. Okay, that he wants to save them too, the Gentiles, not only the Jews. All right, so he goes there. So Peter was to go to Cornelius' house to speak to him about salvation. And this is a verse that's part of his um, discussion with them. And Acts 10, oh, yeah, there you go, Cornelius. Acts 10, 48, Peter here, he's the one commanding. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Amen. Then pray they him to tarry certain days. And we know the name of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So baptize the same way, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. All right. Okay. So, but hey, let me give you one more, okay? I, I know I have enough already. Let me throw in one more because this is a good one, okay? So we talked about, I'm helping you to memorize. Okay, we started with Acts 2, right? We all know that. And then Acts 8, right, with the Samaritans. Acts 10, Cornelius, okay? And then what's the next group, you think? Ephesians. Yeah, don't worry, he saw my notes, okay. <laughs> the Ephesians, okay, the Ephesians. So here, Paul was in Ephesus, and he found some believers um, and asked them how they were baptized, and how were they baptized? They were baptized with John's baptism, okay? And this, take note, this is Paul's response to them. Um, and their response to him afterwards in these verses, in Ephesians 19, 4 and 5. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, 
saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow. Those are strong scriptures, amen? All right, these examples in the book of Acts. So the Ephesians were the first recorded believers to be rebaptized. Amen? That's an example you can give to them. Okay, that, hey, you might need to be rebaptized. Amen? All right. So I want to help you out here um, to, to remember these. Okay, for the, for the baptism in Jesus' name. Let's say you don't have your notes with you. Okay, you may have your Bible. Okay. Um, now, but we want to be able to remember these examples in the book of Acts to support the baptism in Jesus' name. All right? We already know Acts 2, right? Okay, I'm just I'm giving you the chapter. And then Acts 8 is for the Samaritans. What helps me to remember that is the S kind of looks like an 8. All right? Okay, this is Sister La Chica's way of helping you out. Okay, now what about Cornelius for Cornelius? He's a 10, yes. He's the first Gentile to be saved. Hallelujah, a 10. Okay, Acts 10 points. Okay, that helps me to remember it. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> okay, and then Ephesians is tricky, this group. But what helps me is I, I, I think that the P in the Ephesians is an a inverted nine. Okay, but if you can think of a better way, let me know. <laughs> but that's what helps me. Okay, so we did Acts 2, 8, 10, 19. And, of course, you need to know who's that associated with, right? Okay, 10 is easy. Cornelius, then Ephesians, we did that. And then Samaritans, 8, S, 8. Okay, all right. All right. Now I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you three scriptures that support the salvation doctrine of the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, okay? Now let's go talk about that. Other verses for infilling of the Holy Ghost. Um, what do you think is the first one? Yes, the day of Pentecost, right? Okay, Acts 2, all right? And so the Jews on the day of Pentecost. All right, okay. And we know that the Lord appeared to his disciples right after his resurrection and before he ascended. And he gave them final instructions for them to wait for the promise of the Holy Ghost. And I know this is long, but I'm going to read it because it's, it's good scriptures. Okay. And um, you should read them as well to them. If they can read it, it would be even better. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. That's a great scripture. That's a great scripture to a group of scripture to give them. All right. And um, do you remember? Um, or what do you think? It, so so when, you, when you need to remember examples for speaking in tongues as they receive the Holy Ghost, it's it's almost the same as the name of Jesus scriptures minus the Samaritans, okay? So with that, it's 2, Acts 2. What is the next one? 10, 19. Very good. Good class tonight. All right. So 10 is the, is who? Cornelius. 19 is the? All right, you're ready. I don't need to do a handout. Okay, praise God. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. So number two, example here, because I need to give you more scripture, right? Not just one, okay? Not just one, okay? Um, so, but I gave you the first one. Second here is Cornelius, okay, and his household. And earlier I gave you some background on what happened before Peter preached to Cornelius. But here's an interesting thing about Cornelius and his household when Peter was speaking. And it's in Acts 10, 40, 48. While Peter yet spake these words, guess what? The Holy Ghost fell, fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Amen. And then the other verses talk about the water baptism in Jesus' name. That's amazing that the Holy Ghost couldn't wait on Peter. He was still talking, came down upon Cornelius and his household. Thank you, Jesus, right? That's a great example. But remember, after they get the Holy Ghost, if they get the Holy Ghost first, you need to compel them to get baptized in the name of Jesus. It's part of the born-again experience for it to be complete. Amen? All right. Okay, and the third group we know is the Ephesians, okay? Okay. All right, okay, and I like this verse, one of my favorite verses to use um, for the Holy Ghost and filling, speaking in tongues. Acts 19, 6, and when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. All right, any questions? I'm talking to them. Okay, all right, and you guys are good? Okay, so weren't, did, weren't, didn't that sound like good, very good scriptures, okay, on that you'll find examples. And um, later we will discuss the difference between speaking in other tongues as you're filled with the Holy Ghost and the gift of tongues that are recorded in the epistles. We'll talk about that at the end, okay? But first let's go back to the name of Jesus. So what about Matthew 28, 19 that says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. More than likely, this particular verse will be brought up by them at the start of your Bible study, I'm pretty sure, okay, or sometime in between. But better for them not to interrupt you. You, you want to cover the foundation, Okay. You want it, you, you could just politely say, oh, um, we'll talk about, let's talk about that later, okay? Um, just politely tell them, you know, let's talk about that later. And so you want to do it at this time, talk about Matthew 28, 19, all right? Because you want to present the book of Acts verses first. It will flow better that way. So let's study Matthew 28, 19. You know, this was indeed a commandment from the Lord Jesus Christ for the disciples to follow regarding baptism, right? Because he did this before he was ascended. It's like his last final words for them. They need to do this, amen? So here are two ways that this verse has been interpreted and practiced, okay? One is that, there are those that baptize, saying, saying it this way, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, literally reciting the verse during baptism, okay? And the second um, way is to, to apply this is baptizing in the name of Jesus, right? Reciting the name of Jesus as being the name of the Father and as the name of the Son and as the name of the Holy Ghost. And... I understand, and I'm talking to my students, I understand that you believe in the first one, okay? I understand that. And, and I believe in the second one, okay? But listen to me. The, the problem with the first interpretation, okay, is that the problem with that is that I can't find any other verse in the Bible that supports it. I can't. Can you? 
Can you find it? Because I can't. And in fact, there are several verses in the Bible that I just shared with you that support baptism in Jesus' name, okay? That contradict your interpretation. Therefore, I must conclude, because the Bible is our authority, right? Not my opinion, not yours. The Bible is the authority. Therefore, I must conclude that baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost cannot be the correct way to be baptized. All right? Okay. But let me further explain my point by showing you how we rightly divide the Word of God in supporting our doctrine of salvation. Okay? All right. Okay. Why did we choose the book of Acts as the right book or division for our scriptural references? All of them were from, there, from that book, right? Why did we choose that? Okay? And I'm going to give you some points why, okay? Because the book of Acts is the only New Testament book with an actual record of sinners being saved. It is the actual fulfillment of the promise of the New Testament. Remember, it wasn't given yet in the Gospels. Okay, when did it happen? The book of Acts. As sinners were receiving the promise of the Holy Ghost. And the book of Acts also tells us, reveals to us, how the disciples obeyed the Lord's commandments to them. Because the Lord trained them in the Gospels, commanded them to do these things. And um, Matthew 28 was the last book of Matthew, which records the last instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And it is important for us to see the last two verses of Matthew 28. So I'm going to read that. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Jesus speaking, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Take note that verse 19 ends in a colon, which means that the next verse, verse 20, continues the thought. Amen? And what is verse 20 telling us? That the disciples had a big responsibility to teach and do whatever the Lord Jesus taught and commanded them to do. Amen? And that included the command to baptize, correct? Because the Lord Jesus Christ was not anymore on earth, amen? He ascended, is now and back in the form of the Spirit, okay? So it was the job of the disciples, which we call apostles in the book of Acts. Make sense? All right. Okay. And so the book of Acts, which is the recording of events that happened after the Lord's ascension, should tell us how the disciples obeyed what the Lord commanded them to do while he was with them. Correct? I will ask them. Right? Okay. Therefore, I must tell you, my friend, that the book of Acts is a very, very significant book because it shows us how the church was started by the apostles, what they preached how they baptized souls, how they prayed for souls to receive the Holy Ghost. And no other book in the Bible records that. So why skip the book of Acts, right? And the Gospels, because the Gospels and Epistles don't cover that directly. And so if we need to look for the plan of salvation to obey, that we need to obey and follow, where do we find it? We clearly find it in the book of Acts. That's why we chose the book of Acts to get our references from to support our doctrine. Okay? And here's another verse that supports the importance of 
the book of Acts or the teachings of the apostles, what they did in the book of Acts. Ephesians 19, 20, and I'm going to go quick. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And, and that's us, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we need to know what the apostles taught. We need to know what they did, what they commanded the souls. Amen. We need to know this. All right. What about the epistles? Okay. Don't these books talk about salvation too? Yes, they do. But they weren't teaching us how to be saved because the letters were addressed to churches whose members, guess what, were already saved, okay, back in the book of Acts. All right, make sense? Okay, so um, these were letters. The epistles were letters, right? These were letters not written to sinners, but to the church. Just look at the address, the beginning of the letter. It will tell you to whom the letter is for, okay? At the beginning of each epistle, all right? And you will read that it is written to saved people, the churches, the members of the church or the leaders of the church. So no, not one epistle was written to sinners. These were all to churches or leaders of the churches, right? Amen. Every epistle was written to the church, people who were already saved with the born again experience. How do we know that? Read the book of Acts. All right. So very important here. The purpose of the epistles was to explain to the saved people what the plan of salvation meant its significance because when we preach you know we witness to souls we don't go in depth they just need the simple faith right brother john we don't spend three hours for them hold on you need to learn all this right they just need the simple faith to know that when they go down in the water it's the lord jesus Christ's blood covering them and that it's the spirit they're receiving for their salvation that simple faith, you know, that's all they need, okay? But then, and that's where, and that's what happened also in the book of Acts, if you read it right. Um, uh, Peter didn't say, hold on, Cornelius, give me four more hours to talk to you about this, right? Okay? So it gives us an example, right? But that's the purpose of the epistles. Apostle Paul had to explain to them what they just received. You receive something great. Let me tell you more about it because I don't want you to lose it. And I want to help you how to grow in the Holy Ghost. Amen. How you pray with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Um, the blood. The, the Wow. The power of the blood. I want you to know this. So, and, and that's why it's, it's the biggest division, right? Many books. Because that's what, that what was the purpose of that. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, and it does not, okay, right? So the epistles, starting from what? Romans 1, 1, right? Okay, were all the teachings and the instructions of the apostles, the apostles to the saved people about what they did, what they did to be saved and what that meant, but it does not contain... The actual plan of salvation itself as preached by the apostles in the book of Acts. So we're showing them how we're rightly dividing the word of God. Why we chose the division of the book of Acts to base our scripture, supporting scripture from and not the epistles. Okay. All right. So if you're looking for the plan of salvation and how to be saved, you don't look for it in the epistles, but in the book of Acts. All right. Now, let's complete our study on Matthew 28, 19. I wanted to give foundation on that first, why we chose the book of Acts, okay, for that 
are, are, are supporting verse, verses. Okay, so about the name in Matthew 28, 19. I think we can all agree that the name of the Son is Jesus, right? Okay, but let me put that verse anyhow. Let me put it up there. And that's Matthew 1, 21. So we all believe that the name of the Son is Jesus. Matthew 1, 21. And she, Mary, shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay? Therefore, the name of the Son can't be Son. Correct? Okay, son's not a name, right? Okay, all right. So does that also mean that Father and Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit can't be names either? All right, okay. But let's find out what the Bible says about the name of the Father, okay? And discipleship students, can you remember that verse that talks about the name of the Father? Yes, John 5, 43, okay? I am come, the Lord speaking, in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. What is the name of the Father? All right, because Jesus was speaking here, okay? So we know it's Jesus, all right? And that's easy to remember, John 5, 4, 3, right? Okay. And what's the name of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit? We will find that in John 14, 26. You got to memorize that. I don't know any other way to memorize that. I memorized that, memorized that when I was a new convert, so I got it. It's not going. John 14, 26. Okay. But, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost... All right, that verse, whom the Father, Jesus speaking here as well, will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So based on the scripture, what's the name of the Holy Ghost? All right, Jesus. Okay. Okay. And why is it only one name? Okay. One reason here is, take note that Matthew 28, 28, 19 shows the name as being singular, right? The name of the Father and of the Son. I didn't say the names. The name, okay? All right, so singular, okay? So it should be one, right? But not only that. The Bible, you read throughout the Bible, the Bible teaches us that our God is one person. Amen? Amen? Can come in different forms, like the form of the Father, Son, the Spirit, but it's one God, one person, okay? So there must be one name for one person, right? All right, okay. Then, here's a good one. Okay, Ephesians 3, 14, 15 tells us that Jesus is a family name. And that it is the family name of heaven and earth. I love this. Ephesians 3, 14, 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Wow. Okay. Those, did you want to see that again? All right. Okay. Those are good references. Don't worry. I'll include that in the handout. Okay. All right. At this time, you can give them a chance to, to talk, to ask questions about baptism, okay? And don't be afraid because, let me tell you, at this point, you've got enough biblical foundation, okay? In principle and in scripture to support our doctrine and to refute their false doctrine, okay? I've given you enough. I've given you enough. You have enough. All right? So then, okay, I'm going to move on. All right? Well, we're done with the, so, so you just be led by the Spirit with the questions they have. 
Oh, okay. Pastor said to ask them, so what church were you baptized? Or, or you want to ask, how were you baptized, right? And, and they, and a lot of times they'll say, in Jesus' name, right? Okay, and then you, you, what would be good is to ask them, which church were you baptized? What's the name of the church? Where was it? Because we'll, we'll be able to confirm if it was in Jesus' name. And I know Brother John helps us out with that when he teaches the Bible study and they say they were baptized in Jesus' name and he will ask which church and then he'll look it up, okay? All right, when, whenever in doubt, be baptized in the name of Jesus, amen? All right, so let's move on, okay? Then now what about 1 Corinthians twelve thirty? All right, what about that scripture what does that scripture say? Have all the gifts of healing, and Apostle Paul was, was a teaching here, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? So they claim that this verse proves that speaking in tongues is not required for us to be saved or that the practice of speaking in tongues is optional and i'm glad you're here because i'll help you with this okay all right okay so i would ask them do you have another verse or two to support your interpretation okay i would ask that and they're going to be there thinking <laughs> all right but then you just continue to move on all right you know, I, I asked you that because I just gave you several verses that prove otherwise. Okay? All right. And if the book of Acts proves to us that speaking in other tongues was the sign of receiving the Holy Ghost and that it's for everyone to receive in order to be born of the Spirit, then what is 1 Corinthians 12.30 referring to since we can't omit this verse, right? We can't omit this verse from the Bible and the word of God cannot contradict itself, right? We have a problem here, like what Bishop would say, right? We have a problem, the word of God, you know? Well... I've got good news for you. There is no contradiction in the Bible. Amen? Because I'm going to show you how 1 Corinthians 12.30 is not talking about the same type of tongues that we speak when we first receive the Holy Ghost. But it's pertaining to a different type of tongues that has a completely different purpose okay different purpose remember when we first talked about the need to rightly divide the word of God we need to find out that there is a difference between the teachings of the book of Acts from this book of Corinthians okay a significant question to ask is are they focused on the same group of people the book of Acts and the current book of Corinthians, all right? Because the book of Corinthians is in the one of the epistles, right? And we, we learned, right? The book of Acts talks about the sinners, how they were saved. We're in, in the epistles, and the book of Corinthians is one of them, is talking to who? The church, right? Those that are saved, huh, those who are filled with the Holy Ghost already. Amen. All right. Okay. So, the book of Acts is a recording of the history of the church, how sinners were saved. But 1 Corinthians 12 is an epistle or a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth. Okay? And this means that the church members of Corinth have already been filled with the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. And I think Acts 18 talks about the church of Corinth. Okay? Okay? Furthermore, 1 Corinthians 12, 30, 30 is referring to the tongues here as one 
of the nine gifts of the Spirit. And I think King James would call it um, diverse kinds of tongues, and other translations would say um, different kinds of languages. Okay? That's talking about the gift of tongue, the gift, the gift of tongues here, okay? And the purpose of these gifts, all these nine gifts, okay, and other gifts that the Apostle Paul listed in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 12 to 14, the purpose of these gifts is to what? Edify the, the church, all right? Okay, edify the church. The speaking in tongues that's recorded in the book of Acts, what, are, what were those three chapters again? Acts 2, 10, 19, very good, okay. The speaking in tongues that's recorded in the book of Acts 2, 10, 19 is not in reference to the gift of tongues or one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, not the same one. And the purpose of speaking in tongues when we are filled with the Holy Ghost is to what? Edify ourselves. Okay, so these serve two different purposes because they are not the same thing. That's important for them to see the difference. Okay, because I promise you, they're not familiar. They don't know that there's actually several types of tongues, but just focus on those two for now. <laughs> you know, focus on those two, but there are more to it. All right, okay. So here's another thing that, that's very helpful in explaining that there are specific rules, okay? There are, okay, there, there you go. There are specific rules that govern the use of the gifts, okay? Such as with the gift of tongues, all right? And... One of these rules is that there can only be three, up to three messages in tongues, right? And then it has to be one after the other, right? Okay, in order, okay? They can't be all be speaking loudly all together, the gift, when the gift of tongues is in operation, okay? So no more than three, all right? And if there's more than three, the pastor could say stop, okay, to follow biblically. Then after the third message in tongues... They need to be silent, right, as they wait for an interpretation of the message or interpretation of tongues is one of the other gifts, nine gifts of the Spirit. And we know that's one way how the church is edified, okay? So no more than three messages in tongue, one at a time. And the interpretation of tongues is required after the messages of tongues if it's more than one. Now, let's compare that, okay, for the believer when the believer speaks in tongues in prayer, okay? For the believer who is filled with the Holy Ghost and speaks in tongues, there is no limitation to how many times he can speak in tongues. In fact, the Apostle Paul encourages us to pray in tongues a lot, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 18 says that. Um, and if you read about those who spoke in tongues in the book of Acts, amen, Acts 2, 10, 19, amen, you will find out that there was no interpretation after, that's recorded after they spoke in tongues, right? Peter said, wait, wait, let's get an interpretation of that. No, you will not find it because it wasn't required. It's a different thing. It's a different type of tongue. Okay? All right. So whenever we pray in tongues to edify ourselves or to intercede for others, as the Spirit leads us to, no interpretation is needed because it is the Spirit, amen, that is helping us to pray. Good scripture for that is Roman Romans 8, 26, we need help, okay? Because the Spirit knows all things, okay? Our understanding of what the Spirit is praying through us is not necessary for our prayers to become effective, all right? Okay. Oh, I'm about to close, okay. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 30, 
The apostle was implying that not everyone is used in the same gift, that some may have the gift of healing, some may have the gift of tongues, and some may not. And that's okay. Because the possession of a particular spiritual gift or being used in a specific gift is not a salvation issue. Okay? All right. Sorry, I missed those. All right. Okay? However, the infilling of the Holy Ghost is a requirement for salvation as the Lord commanded that. Amen? Amen? And as the apostles applied that in the book of Acts, okay? And speaking in tongues is the initial and tangible sign. It's a sign. It's a sign, okay? An initial and tangible sign that proves that one has been filled with the Spirit of God as we read it in the book of Acts. And remember, it's the Holy Ghost that saves us. Not the speaking of tongues. Okay? It's the Holy Ghost in us. Okay? But we need to speak in tongues in order for the Spirit to pray through us. Does that make sense? All right. Well, I'm done with my lesson. And let's see if Pastor wants to take over and ask questions or... Amen. Would you worship the Lord right now? Receive that in Jesus' name. Would you thank Him that that could be imparted into your spirit, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ? We receive that, Lord. What we learned, what we heard tonight, God, that you might quicken, you might quicken that into our spirit when we need it, Lord, as you have commanded us to teach this word in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Any questions? Any questions? Brother John? And, you know, sometimes they'll be hanged up. They'll hang up, be a hang up for them that, of what Paul said, do all speak in tongues. Right? So they'll, they'll ask you that. Do all. Well, the Bible says right here, do all speak in tongues. And, and it's actually interesting. If you read through that, so Paul talks about, I'd rather you speak in the tongues of men you could, so you could be understood and somebody could be edified. But he also said that tongues are for unbelievers. And so when the gift of tongues is operating in the church, people that are present that probably don't believe, and then there's an interpretation, they will feel in their spirit, that's something supernatural. And, and if you read through, though, and, and in, in 1 Corinthians 14, I believe it was, it is, uh, it also says that, after, after 1 Corinthians 14, verse 13, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So, so he switches there from the gift of tongues to praying in tongues. Right? Are you with me? And, and so he said, what is it then? So he asks actually a question. So he makes a distinguish, uh, a distinction rather between the gift of tongues and praying in tongues. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with understanding also. So when I pray in the Spirit, I'm praying in tongues because I don't understand that. Then I will pray with understanding, meaning what comes out of my mouth, I understand what I'm praying about. In fact, it says I will sing with the Spirit. All the singers, you need to sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with understanding also. So you could sing in tongues. If you've never done that, man, you ought to try it. You're missing out if you don't. 
you'll actually sound better. Amen. Verse 16, As, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not verified. And then he qualifies this in verse 18, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. So that whole discourse is not saying not everybody speaks in tongues. you got to read the whole thing. Because he wouldn't say that, that I speak in tongues more than you all. Well, we can't speak in tongues in the church because nobody would understand. So when you pray in tongues, that is in prayer, right? That's prayer. Is his house called the house of prayer? Or do we just pray outside with just us because, you know, nobody can understand? So that, 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 and if a person's hungry, they'll see that. Uh, and so he's talking about the gift of tongues. Any other questions or thoughts? Sister Dana? Which one? That is 1 Corinthians 14. And, uh, what is that verse? I forgot. For he said, uh, what is it then? Verse 15. First Corinthians 14, 15. So that's easy to understand. First Corinthians, the first book, 14, 15. Okay. Acts 10, 19. 10, 19. There's a song actually that talks about people who went to Vietnam. The average age is 19, 19. So that's, that's how I remember that. The average age of the people that fought in Vietnam is 19. So whatever works for you to make you remember, 19, 19. 10 is easy. You're a 10, Brother Jim. That doesn't agree. Anybody else? So, so what are the questions have you been asked? Like, you know, baptism in Jesus' name, right? One of those. And, and but David. Reminding me that because when you ask a question, I actually forgot what I said. So that's that's pretty good what the Lord said because I've forgotten. Obviously, it wasn't my words. But when you baptize somebody, the person being baptized has to have some form of faith that what they're doing is obeying the Word of God, and what they're obeying. They may not explain. They may they may not be able to explain to you the plan of salvation, but there's a witness in their spirit. I'm doing this in obedience. Because when I got baptized, I, I can't explain to you what it meant if you asked me. I just knew this is right. This, is, this, this feels right. I believe this. I'm doing this. I'm not doing this for anybody else. I, I am doing this. And so that, that measure of faith, otherwise if there's no faith in whatever you do, you're just, in baptism, you're just getting wet. Uh, but that, that's, a good, that's a good question when, when you're teaching and how many of you realize we have to teach this? We, we can't come here and learn and learn and learn and just get fat with it and never let it out. In fact, the more it goes out, the more revelation you get. And, and we got to get, we got to find somebody. I believe God wants us to teach 100 Bible studies. Right now we're 19. 19, 19. And, and, and so it's, it's we, we've got to take it out on the streets. And we got commitment cards. We will help you. We will help each other. And, and so w when somebody says, hey, uh, I, I think I was baptized in Jesus' name. You think? 
So, so, so when they actually say that, that's already a red flag. Because if you're asked, were you, Sister Rachel, were you baptized in Jesus' name? It's not like, oh, I think so. No, I, I know. Be, because when that obedience to the truth happens in your life, you know. Did, did you speak in tongues? You know, I'm, yeah, I think so. No. How, what do we say? Every day, right? So when the, the, their answer already kind of leads you to doubt, and then I think Sister Chica or Brother John mentioned, you ask them, so what church were you baptized in? And they tell you a church, and guess what? You could Google it and find out what they believe. And 90 plus percent of churches don't baptize in Jesus' name. You know, there, there's a YouTube video actually. And so think about this. If somebody baptizes you in someone's name or the name of a God that they don't even know, and it's a triune God, your baptism is not valid. I mean, does that make sense? You're baptized in a false God, into idolatry. And, and, and I, I, I hear it, and you can Google it, you go to Facebook, People baptize, and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and Yeshua, Yeshua, Hamashita, and, and then they'll add, in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm like, so which one was it? You don't even know who you're baptizing. That doesn't remit sin. That makes sense? And, and I think that's, you know, I, and I, I learned this today. Ask them, what church were you baptized in? And you Google it. You know, and we baptized a Marine a long time ago, Eli Mills, and I don't remember him. We, we were target shooting there in Camp Pendleton, and I was witnessing to him, asking him, so how were you baptized? He goes, I think I was baptized in, in I think I was baptized in Jesus' name. I go, do, do you know? Are you sure? She, I go, well, I guess I got to find out. Then he goes, you know what? That's a lot of work to find out. Let's just do it. I go, I agree. Let's just do that. And he got baptized in Jesus' name. Now, now, we got to take this into the streets. Tuesday, I want to ask you to pray for the Westminster group. Is it Westminster or Westminster? Westminster, like Westminster Abbey in the UK, I guess that's where we're getting it. But there's hungry people there. So Brother Paul taught there two, two weeks ago, and, and I guess he said, I'll bring somebody that will teach you and he didn't tell me that. He told me after the fact. So there's some people there that were prepared to argue. And, and uh, so he got heated, you know. Um, I was not offended. I answered it. Um, but the beautiful thing is, you know, God, God kind of gave me a glimpse of how it would be in the last days that we will be contending for the faith. If you were earlier, Brother Dylan prayed for the spirit of timidity and fear to be taken off of the church. And we will go out there and, and just contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so they, I think three of them, you know, got up. And I mean, they were arguing as well as themselves. One was standing up for me. And, and you know, if one is, is on your side, and even if they're in error, don't shut them down. God's using them to stop a distraction. And, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> thank God I got enough sleep. You know, I'm happy. I ate, and I was not—I was not riled at all. I'm like, hey, if you don't believe this, eventually you're not going to answer to me. You're going to answer to God. This is between you and the Lord. I'm the messenger. I'm the mailman. You don't shoot the mailman, right? When he gives you your bill in your mailbox. I mean, do you camp out there and wait for him, right? But but it's a glimpse. How many believe God's going to use you to teach somebody? You know, God is doing this now. He's opening doors of groups of people that don't have the full truth. Some of them don't have the truth at all. And uh, Brother David, in can you stand real quick and, and testify? I want you to hear this because this is what the Lord is doing. This is also what the Lord is doing at the Westminster Group. Jesus' name. So in um, last Saturday, I felt called to... Um, do an outreach in our neighborhood, and we were going house to house, but the previous Sunday, uh, me and my little brother, we went around just introducing ourselves. I started beginning to tell everyone, well, we're walking down the street. We've been here for 10 years. We don't, we 
didn't even realize. We didn't even reach out to our neighbors. So we're trying to be friendly, meet our neighbors. And we actually met a family. Um, his name is Nick. And we we introduced ourselves and we didn't really think much of it. And then this past Saturday, we printed out some home group flyers to invite them to home group. And we gave them a home group um, invitation and Nick was talking to me. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry. We can't make it on Thursday because we're actually going to church on Thursday. But on Monday, we're going to be teaching a Bible study on the book of Acts. And I said, can I come? Can I come to your Bible study? And he's like, oh, yes, of course. And then so this past Monday, um, my, me and my wife, uh, my little brother and my mom, we went to, we went to the Bible study and we were coming with, I didn't even really know what to expect, but I knew they were going to talk about the book of Acts. So I knew something was going to happen. And as soon as we got in, they were so friendly. They were greeting us, introducing us. There was at least like 10, 15 people inside. They were introducing us to everyone, and it was amazing. And then they, the Nick, the owner of the house, he's like, all right, let's pray. And as soon as we started prayer, he started with tongues and then went into English, but then when he realized we were praying in tongues, everyone was praying in tongues in that house. Yeah. And there was such a powerful move of God. We were praying for like 15 minutes straight, nothing but the Holy Ghost. Just, we didn't really care what they really believed in. We just knew that there was a Spirit of God in this place, and let's rejoice together. And it was funny, at the end of the Bible study, Nick came up to me. He was like, you know, man, I, I was really hoping you weren't going to get weirded out when we were started to speak in tongues. I really hoped you weren't going to get weirded out. And I was like, I'm sorry, I thought I, I, thought I was going to weird you out by speaking in tongues. But they went over the entire um, first two chapters of the book of Acts, and they were agreeing together, and God began to minister unto them about a relationship instead of a religion to push forward, to reach out to families, to reach out, and there was this one distinct statement about saving your families. This lady, she began to say, I want to see my son saved. I want to see my kids saved, and I stopped praying. She was like, you know what? I don't know about you guys, but I started praying, God, I pray that you would do whatever it takes. Make them miserable, miserable. bring them to repentance, do whatever it takes to save them. And I was like, yes, praise God. But these are hungry people in our own neighborhood. In our own neighborhood. We've been in that street for 10 years and... Finally, the boldness of God is a coming upon the church and you have no idea that your next door neighbor and he began to tell me, well, that neighbor, he's actually a pastor. That neighbor is actually a pastor too. On that side, we have Bible studies other every other Monday and it's all in your neighborhood. You just got to allow the Holy Ghost to connect to those who are hungry. I do believe they believe in a triune God, but God's going to break that wall. God has brought us there for a purpose, and God has brought us there at the right moment, and it was de definitely divine by God. And just yesterday, I got a call from some lady in Alaska. Some lady in Alaska called me saying that, um, are you a pastor? I, 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 found your, I found your website, and I found your church on the UPCI website, and my mother lives there in Buena Park. I want to teach her a Bible study. Would you be available to baptize her if she agrees? And I said, of course. And then she said, well, I have family. I have nieces, nephews, sisters, uncles who all need to be baptized. I'm the only one and my son are the only one that have been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. And God is opening up doors, church. This 21-day fast that we did was not in vain. God is opening up doors. And if God can open up doors for you, God can open up doors for you. You just got to be bold. You just got to stand forth with the gospel. You got to just spread the word. We've had wonderful teachings from Pastor, Sister Lachika, Brother John. You have a foundation. Go ahead and share it. Go ahead and share it. In Jesus' name. Would you pray right now that God would lead you to a hungry person? 
a hungry family, hungry people. In the name of Jesus, use us, Lord. We are your body on the earth, God. We make ourselves available. We're not going to serve the pursuit of riches, God. We're going to serve you, Lord. We can't serve two masters, Father. We have to give you our time, our energy, our effort, our intellect, everything you have invested in us, Lord. We give it back to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Be bold. You can teach your family. Be bold. You can teach your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors. They're hungry. They're hungry. You know, it's interesting in Acts 19 verse 9, but when diverse or different people were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude, Paul departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Two years he reached all of Asia. Because he went to a group of people that were not, that were unchurched, and they were open. I told them, you know what? As long as Westminster is open, there's an open door, we're going to walk through it. Was it enjoyable? Yeah, you know, kind of. I mean, is it enjoyable when somebody opposes you? Not really, but you can't take it personal, right? But as long as there's hungry people. You know, the beautiful thing was when, when people left, about three or I don't know how many of them left, the people that were left, and some of them were not even really convinced, but they stayed. Because at least they were humble enough that when the scripture was given, it's like, yeah, you know, that kind of makes sense. And then we prayed, and the people that were kind of against tongues, guess what? They prayed in tongues. This lady, Lynn, that she was kind of like, I don't know where she stood. We prayed. They prayed. Actually, I started already kind of packing and eating and Somebody got me and said, hey, can you pray for her? And I didn't pray for her. I didn't even lay hands on her. People were praying for her, laying hands. I just said, let it flow, Lynn. Let it out. And she started talking in tongues. And before that, she was a little adversarial. And, and to the end, she was hugging everybody. She goes, don't leave before not getting me a hug. I'm like, okay. I was like kind of panicking. I mean, she gripped me like she was a wrestler. And I mean, I was hurting. I go, I need to breathe here. <laughs> but that it was beautiful towards the end. There was laughter. There, were, there was encouragement. In fact, they said, you guys are going to be back, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's horrible for my schedule when I go up there because then I have to work the next day. So I had five hours of sleep last night. Because when I get home, I just can't go to sleep right away. I'm like wired. So I'm eating peanuts and talking and... I slept at 2 o'clock in the morning, woke up at 6.25. So, but you know what? You speak in tongues the whole day. God gives you rest. And then when you can, you sleep. But I believe God's going to give us supernatural doors that will open. And God will lead you to the hungry and the hungry to you. <coughs> Excuse me. Dale, would you pray in closing? You know, I just want to say this before they do that. So Dana and Dylan, Sister Jessica and David were there, Brother Paul, and they sang. Them, not Brother Paul. And they sang. They ushered in the presence of God. And 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 they were, Brother Paul, all of them, they were such a, they, they brought the atmosphere of the Lord and, and, and a witness of the Holy Ghost. And, and that's important realize this, if either there's just you or somebody with you, when you enter the room, you take dominion and authority. The Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the, word, in the world. When you enter that room, you're the most important, the most powerful person, not in a, in a conceited way, but Christ in you. He's greater than anything. And you have to have that faith. I take authority here. 
I'm not just some Joe Schmo that doesn't know anything. I'm a child of God. I am an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm delivering his word. That's all that God is asking me to deliver the word. Whether they believe it or not, it's immaterial. That's beyond my control. But I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be uh, abrasive. Now, I've made that mistake before where, where they challenge you and you just, man, you're like, all right, let, let's, let's see who. We, we go to Spectrum a lot, you know, and there's, there's this guy for months that would come. And as we witness to invite people, to get, he goes, don't, don't listen to them. They're, they're a cult. They're, they're demonic. Well, I got, man, I, I wasn't cool back then. I was just, so I just confronted him. And he said, you don't have to be mean. I go, you know, you're, you're stupid. Get out of here. I'll give you one minute to wrap up your thought and leave. No, I don't know if that's right or not. Maybe there's a right time for that or not. Uh, you know, I don't know. But you pray for me. Thank God I was not like that last night. Amen. As Brother Paul said, you were cool as a cucumber. Jesus' name. Brother John? And here's an indication when people are open. Um, you could stand that way. I could stop talking. When people are open. So they, they, these kids right here prayed through a 72-year-old man uh, last Saturday, I think, or Sunday. Herman is the name. And as they were praying, he was, he was, he wanted, he's listening, he's obedient. He's copying whatever is being said to him. He's repeating it. And so you got to be conscious. And that, that, that's not bad, actually. So they're being led. That's when you lead them the right way. In Westminster group, it's, it's so funny. This one guy, when, when Brother Rodriguez was there, and I think you were there, Brother Paul, this one guy, we were praying to the Holy Ghost. I was trying to tell him, stop talking English. Let your tongue do what it wants to do. And he was trying so much, he goes, yabba dabba do. And it took everything in me not to laugh. But I go, you know, at least he was actually wanted to be led. That, that, that's the first one that I've ever heard. Of. That is just so funny. It's amazing. Amen. Go ahead, little man. And close this out. Lord, you have imparted a burden to reach the loss upon us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that every single person here would begin to grab that burden and take it out into the streets, O oh Lord, that we would take it outside, O oh Lord, not just in our prayer rooms, O oh God, but Lord, let your spirit begin to lead us to begin to go out to the streets, O oh Lord, to every city, to every nation, O oh Lord, to every country, O oh God, that you have drawn your people, O oh Lord, to us, O oh God. I'll just say, boldness upon us to reach the lost. A boldness to reach every group of people, every ethnicity, every country, every nation, O oh Lord. You have ordained it, O oh Lord, and we lose your perfect will to be done in the city of Mission VA, O oh Lord, to reach our families, God, to reach our friends, O oh Lord, to reach every coworker, to reach every classmate, Father. Lord, you have ordained us, O oh Lord, to be a light in our city. We release your love, O oh God, your burden to compel us to reach the lost. And Lord, we receive the spirit of boldness today in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we receive your will to carry out this gospel. We receive it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We're excited of the doors that you're opening, God. We will walk through them in Jesus' name. If you know anybody that's hungry to have a Bible study, see someone or teach it yourself. Bring somebody with you. Amen. And you will have the joy of the Lord. You know, he was so busy this week. And the Lord kind of told me, this is a glimpse of what's going to happen in the last days when I pour out my spirit. The church will be so busy. And, and we need to start having that faith that God is going to supernaturally provide for us. There is 
there is a the reason that Jesus, when asked, teach us to pray, he said, give us this day our daily bread. All of us or a lot of us will quit our jobs, and God will supernaturally provide for you. Anybody want to believe that? In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for Sister Terry that you provide her for a car, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. You promised that, God, we claim it. Lord, we claim it even through its completion, God. Through this dimension of time, we claim it, Father. I release your blessing upon every person here, Lord. Even as you build up their bank account, God, maybe that's your way, Lord, that they could quit. And they could earn something, oh God, out of investment. Uh, whatever your will is, God, I, I release blessings upon them uh, that we would put you first, God. You said you'll add these things. Uh, all these things will just be an addition. It's your, it comes from you. You add it to us. It's a gift from you, God. And we will receive it, Father, in the name of Jesus. I love each and every one of you. God bless you. We'll see you this for the Connect Group tomorrow and Sunday. Good to see you, Lorraine. Bless you. In Jesus' name.